Welcome. This is David Bowles, Human Meme. Today's topic, Glom Research. We know the world is condescending, and time is compressing, and people are getting lazier and less interested in living by the moment. The other day, I received an email from a woman who claimed to have a long repository of teaching credits, research papers, and major newspaper and periodical publication bylines. This woman had read an article I previously wrote about Freud, Sigmund Freud, and the transformational womb. And she said she, too, was writing about the same subject. And then she asked me, told me, really, to send her all of my notes and citations and footnotes, all in the spirit of cooperation and collegiality and cordiality. So she could then use my work, my research, my thoughts, my wants, my reasoning, to help her write her article under her name, with no credit for me. And I'm sure, if there was money and copyright involved, I would not have shared in any of that either. My original article, well-researched and documented, was not enough for her. She wanted more. Aren't people wonderfully evil and preternaturally awful? And when they reveal themselves to you, believe them. What a beast this woman was to dare to contact me in the first place about an article I wrote a decade ago and then thinking that it's okay for her to even ask me for my proprietary research and notes and thoughts on the matter. That behavior alone told me she was not as successful or as well-published as she claimed. Now, if you think it's okay to make such an approach and such a request, let me tell you, it is not okay. It is not done. Making such an ask is the mark of the rank amateur. See, this is the problem with modern America and academe in the now, is that we now have personalities like that bubbling around who believe they are entitled to all the credit and all the riches of others while doing none of the work themselves. Oh, and they believe they've worked and earned for it all. Just by emailing you. Now be wary. That sort of person is all around you, and they become insidious when they move beyond the ramifications of their professional behavior and begin to interact with children and the elderly and their peers. The world stops for them. They have unreasonable false expectations of the world, and their every wish is granted by those who are their enablers and by those who just want the person to go away and leave them alone. For these people to be denied anything is to cause a personal affront to them. And they will wage war against you by threatening you and harassing you and by contacting your workplace boss and by making an example out of you on social media and by going after your distant family members and former loves and dead pets. You know the type. The absolutely insoluble among us, who have no insight or humor or revelations of their own character 
into themselves, except when they are being told how great and special they are. So, the woman who asked me to turn over my world of Freud womb research was ignored. And I've learned that is the best way to deal with those sorts of unreasonables. Provide them the wind. Because then they're punching back into air. And if you respond in any way that doesn't grant their demands, then you've made yourself dry powder for their TNT and be prepared for them to blow you apart. Now, let's say circumstances had been slightly different. I knew this woman. We grew up together. She was a distant friend of a friend of mine. What she asked is still not proper or copacetic. Asking me to hand her all of my research notes for her publication benefit is uncouth. It's bad form. It is not. Done. Students are usually the worst violators of the you do it for me meme in education. Instead of asking possible research contacts for their insight and experience, they will instead turn to the instructor and ask for help, where to start, and where to start interviewing and everything else that is part of their assignment to learn how to research. Now, all of that is fine. As the instructor, you give advice and directives, you teach, but when the student then turns around and continues to return to you asking for more help and notes and research advice, and they reject your advice to go to the writing center for help, in structuring a paper or getting help in the basic planning of writing a paper, then there isn't much you can do because you are not going to write the paper for them even though that's what they expect. And so you have been pressed into the role, the unwanted role of the bad guy because you didn't give in to or acquiesce to the bad behavior of the student in need. And I remind you, there is grave danger in standing up to that sort of anti-intellectual subordination because you will be fought for not helping enough or for being mean or dismissive or some other mindless cudgel that is used against you instead of the student actually doing the work. If these students put as much work in researching their papers as they do in conniving against their teachers or in trying to scam the system so they don't actually have to write the paper but still get an A grade, they would be wildly successful. But they know, working hard, is no fun. They know causing trouble for people is where all the fun is at. Making themselves the victim is where they believe their victory is found. One teacher friend of mine instructed his students to do one live interview of one living person as part of their final research paper in an upper-level, private, big-city, university psychology course. The first time he made the assignment, every student wanted to interview him. The next semester, he made the same assignment, and he told the students he was not available for any interviews. All the students tried to interview the chair of his department. My friend, sussing out their inbred generational laziness 
and lack of personal compunction to actually do the right thing, my friend banned any student from interviewing anyone who had anything to do with the university. Well, then there was a rebellion against him. The students claimed it was impossible for them to go off campus for an interview. The students said a phone interview was impossible because it takes too much time to sync differing schedules. The students complained that email interviews were too hard and impersonal because email is unreliable in sending and delivery. The student excuses and hatreds worked on and on and on. Complaints were made against my friend, and luckily, the university is now sort of aware of these tactics and terroristic threats from some of the divided student population who prefer to set a campus on fire, and the matter was summarily dealt with. However, a decade ago, a university reacted much differently when any sort of little whinny or microaggression was made into a major case against any faculty member or fellow student. The faculty member was always wrong by default because they were older and wiser and better trained and more mature, and the students, well, they didn't just know anything. It took a long while for the administration to catch on to the glom that the game being played was to just play the game without having to do any of the work and still getting all A grades. And today, things are better. The game is caught on. As long as we're on a research rant, here are a couple of other hints against bad behavior. If you are teaching a class and you're new, it is not proper to ask another teacher for a copy of their syllabus. A syllabus is proprietary, copyrighted, sacrosanct, and is of the mind and teaching of one particular instructor. A lot of work goes into preparing a right syllabus, and to ask for a copy is to reveal yourself to be lazy, or a cheater, or just a copier. Now, if a syllabus is offered to you or pushed onto you and you have to teach it, different story. But if you ask for a syllabus you did not write, Prepare to get a collegial cold shoulder or to be ghosted because to tell you right to your face that you're an inappropriate bore won't likely happen unless you're lucky. As well, in the business world, don't ask for notes or a business plan you did not write. Do the work yourself. One thing that both students and business folk don't mind asking for, even though it is, again, uncouth and boundaried, is wanting a copy of a PowerPoint presentation. Um, no. PowerPoint presentations are also copyrighted and proprietary, and if they are done right, they take a long time to design and construct and create so they're interesting to an audience. That's why you want a copy. So for you to raise your hand in the audience after the presentation to ask that a copy of the PowerPoint presentation be emailed to you or downloaded by you on the Internet is horrible for you. For you are self-identifying as a selfish idiot with no redeeming qualities. Write your own PowerPoint presentation. Do not try to steal someone else's hard work and then try to make it your own with a few edits and regionalities. I'm sure a lot of this 
sounds like common sense, and it is. But it is also quickly becoming common sense against the norm. And that's a terrible thing. People don't want to do the work. Fine, there are others who will do the work. But that doesn't stop the lazy among us who still want the participation trophy for showing up and looking pretty and breathing. And they still want to be included, and they still want what you have so they can put their name on it too. It's only fair, right? And it is that sort of mentality that will more quickly lead to the downfall of democracy than all the blazing guns in the world could even start to befell us all as witnesses against irrelevancy. Thank you for listening. Be a human meme.